Welcome back to Wireless Without Batteries, 8813. This should be lecture number 14. And our topic today is reflection amplification. And we may get a little bit into the next topic as well today because it's not that long where we do some uh, communication system modeling for low powered communication. Talk about some deals, some issues with the channel that you have to work through when um, you have a, a, a nasty communications channel uh, that's not traditional in most wireless systems. Okay, so the reflection amplification today uh, is another form of backscatter that greatly enhances the range of backscatter systems while co still consuming relatively little electronic power at a node. This is to allow us to pull information across great distances without expending a lot of joules. In fact, that's the key metric, joule, joules per bit that we are focusing on in um, uh, recent recent discussions so as for the website I've uploaded a, a whole series of papers should have um, there should be one on there by Trotter this is number from lecture number 13 uh, Trotter from around 2012 this retro directivity Um, let's see, there's another topic. Involving today's discussion from 2015. It was on a tunnel diode modulator. And then from perhaps this or most likely next year's or next class period's lecture, I have a background paper, some notes on um, communications. channel modeling for backscatter. Hmm. So those should be on there along with uh, the project sheet that should be up there with some sample project topics and the deadlines that we talked about. And I, I will also get the uh, solutions to test one up on there since we don't have any more outstanding tests. Okay. Any questions before we go on administratively? No? Great. Now. The first thing that we're going to lead off is what is a reflection amplifier? Most people that even have a passive um, exposure to RF, so to speak, is uh, are familiar with two port amplifiers. These are the ones that you buy off of mini circuits or Mauser, or I'm sure there's probably a whole bunch of them at that electronics component depot here in Shenzhen that uh, you can check out. And uh, this is basically where you have an input and an output, two ports, electrically speaking. Signal goes in, you get an increased signal going out with gain. Now a reflection ang amplifier is actually a one-point port amplifier. And whenever you talk about RF 
devices or microwave devices we often characterize those with s parameters right how many of here of ever work measured an s parameter on a piece of equipment raise your hand no one that's okay you, you have mo young Uh, that's right. Transmission and reflection. Yes, yes. Have you ever made a measurement like that? Uh, yes. Okay, we have one out of six. I bet you if I took this, uh, made this quiz on my distance learning students, it would be the other way around because they all worked in industry and they've probably come across the really expensive pieces of equipment that you need to do to make these type of measurements. An S matrix. You can actually define a, an S matrix for an N port device. And they're basically a series of transmission and reflection coefficients. So if you have N devices, your S11 here up in the corner would be how much reflects back from port number one, from port number one when you excite port number one. And you usually assume that all the other ports are terminated in 50 ohm connections when you make that measurement. And then the next thing you measure is an S21, which is how much port uh, power gets, uh, actually. It's 1B. Yeah. I got my matrix flipped here. Let me fix that real quick. S21, which is how much signal energy comes back on port number two when you excite signal number one. So you think of that as like a transmission coefficient. And then of course you have an S12 and S22 is the reflection coefficient and you can define these. And if the device is linear, this is a great way to characterize it. You have almost all the information you need to, to understand how this multi-port device behaves in a microwave circuit. So if you have an, an S11, or if you have a one port device, there's really only one scattering coefficient that you can possibly measure for that device. And that's basically gonna be the ratio of what comes out of port one, what we call V1 minus, the amplitude and phase of the wave traveling out of the device, as a proportion of whatever amplitude and phase you hit the device with, or that would be your V1 plus. So this comes from transmission line theory, right? You're looking at traveling waves that are going to and from a device. You're not looking at the, this is kind of different than the Thevenin equivalent that you used in early circuit theory to characterize what's going on. Because the Thevenin equivalents, all you're measuring is the total voltage, right? And the total voltage, voltage is the sum of V minus plus V plus at a port. But when you get down to high, high frequencies, up in upper RF frequencies, microwave, millimeter waves, uh, we have to make this distinction. So there's part of the wave that you're measuring is a wave that is hitting a device, and then the other part of the wave is the wave that's reflecting from the device. And we really need to know how both of those components behave if we want to embed this in a circuit, on a circuit board, or as you know, even a part of a chip now, you have to take into account V pluses and V minus when you do high speed chip design now. Uh, things are going so quickly. And so we use S parameters as one of several techniques that are accepted in uh, electrical engineering, probably the most popular ones for RF and, and uh, microwave engineers. Now, if the device is passive, right, then, and, and everything is sort of designed for 50 ohms, then, the reflection coefficient should be less than negative one. The magnitude should be less than negative one. Keep in mind that these scattering matrices, these S parameters matrices, are phasers. In a sense, we usually measure them at RF, so they have an amplitude and a phase. We take the magnitude of that, the magnitude should be less than, than one, because there's no way for a passive device to add energy unless you're smuggling it in from somewhere else. So if I have a, a, an antenna and a port on it, antenna being just a piece of metal, that, should have an, that port should have an S11, and that S11, the magnitude should always be less than one. Now, what are some scenarios where it would be not less than one? 
Well, we'd, we'd have to find some way to smuggle power into the, yeah. Yeah, and, and one of those ways is with a reflection amplifier. So you can bias a semiconductor, take a transistor, bias it, and turn it in, into an amplifier, but one that reflects power. And that's really what gives you a one port amplifier. So now let's take a look. Let's start with our model for load modulation. Let's say we have two load states to switch between. So here's my receive antenna. I should call it a tag antenna because it's going to be scattering. Z1 is load number one. Z2 is load number two. In conventional backscatter modulation, I have a reflection coefficient for each of those states. That reflection coefficient is basically going to be Z1 or 2 minus whatever the impedance is for my antenna complex conjugate oops divided by z1 or z2 plus antenna and you do not put a complex conjugate on the bottom i'll explain the difference there in a second why that's the, the case but uh, let's just start with this So one thing that a reflection amplifier can do is make the reflection coefficient look as if it is larger than magnitude 1. And there are a lot of ways to do this. You can build these with conventional semiconductors. But we're going to look at an example where we use a tunnel diode. So why would a tunnel diode be a really good example of this, or a really good device for making one of these? Well, recall what the tunnel diode is. We're going to draw its VI characteristic. Remember, a conventional diode looks like this. A conventional junction that has a turn on voltage, V sub T, where it really starts to take off. And you start to get a lot of current as you increase voltage. At low voltages or negative voltages, however, you've got this saturation current here that you you have. It. Remember what the tunnel diode is, is it's got a broken band gap. Remember, it's got so heavily overdoped that the conduction band of one of the uh, semiconductor junctions is at the same Fermi level as the valence band of the other material. And therefore, you actually get this tunneling phenomenon where the electrons can jump across to the valence band and tunnel up to the conduction band and keep going. So it looks like an, uh, an ohmic junction at that point. And then all of a sudden it kicks in and you get this negative re region. So the tunnel diode looks kind of like this. Uh, let me switch colors here. This is not the color I wanted. It looks kind of like an ohmic junction through here. <laughs> it should go through z zero, though. Not an active device. And then it boomerangs and has this negative resistance region and then turns kind of into more of a classic diode characteristic as, you, as you've increased the voltage across the device and now the band gaps are closer together uh, or the Fermi levels are starting to get closer together and it's acting more like a regular diode. And this, this region in here is the interesting part. Because if you bias here, your load appears to have a negative AC resistance. So it presents a negative 
you know, 50, negative 70, negative 90 ohms, depending on what the device is that's connected to there. So let's say that you've matched the device here so that Z1 is equal to 50 ohms. And let's say you've designed an antenna, ZA, so that it's a 50 ohm antenna as well. And that your second state is biased in such a way so that the, reflect the slope there is negative 50 ohms. What happens when energy is impinging upon this system? Well, reflection coefficient 1, well, that's really easy to calculate. It's a matched system. I have 50 ohm load minus 50 ohm antenna over 50 ohm plus 50 ohm, I get 0. For the second state, I have minus 50 ohm load, minus 50 ohm complex conjugate. I don't even need to include that because it's not, uh, not complex. And then divide by negative 50 plus 50. Whoa, that's infinity. So what this says is that I can actually reflect a lot more power out of the antenna than is actually put into the antenna when I'm biased at this one location. Okay, now keep in mind we're not playing any games with conservation of power. Conservation of energy, conservation of power holds. We're not going to be able to hook a bunch of tunnel diodes to antennas and bask in the free unlimited energy that we've created, right? This is behaving just like a regular amplifier. How does a regular amplifier work? You bias it with DC and then when you put an AC signal in, you're borrowing DC energy and converting it up to RF when you do that. When you get a signal out that's bigger than the signal in, you're taking DC bias energy and converting it to higher frequencies. We're doing the opposite of what an energy harvesting circuit does, right? So if that's the case, then really when we bias it here, it's going to take energy to bias the tunnel diode in that region. Now, fortunately for us, it's going to take a lot less energy than if you were to use a field effect transistor or a BJT. Because remember this region in the tunnel diode over here, this occurs down at tens of millivolts, right? Once you're, this is probably no greater, this bias point is no greater than 100 millivolts. In that case, that's well below the turn on voltage for even most diodes. You know, most semiconductors, especially most field effect transistors, most CMOS circuits, you need at least a few hundred millivolts before uh, you can actually see some nonlinear behavior out of the device. We try to operate logic down there, but it doesn't work very well. There's a whole field uh, called sub-threshold uh, logic where you're trying to bias with just a few hundred millivolts because you still get the nonlinearities out there, but it's not in saturation the way that you know, you've all been taught to bias things and operate devices in your undergraduate days. But the tunnel diode works even better at threshold, at, at voltages that are beneath what is considered healthy sub-threshold circuitry for classical silicon CMOS. And in truth, you don't get infinite reflection coefficient. That's using a linear model with a negative resistance. What actually happens, if I, let me draw a clean curve. Here's my VI curve for my tunnel diode. I bias here. And what will happen is that as the wave strikes the antenna with this particular load, so if I were to draw this in circuit theory, I would have, I would use the, my tunnel diode symbol. And of course I'd have to bias it. So I'd have some sort of, you know, RF choke connected to a DC bias. 
the simplified circuit. I would bias it here, and eventually this thing is going to start to oscillate. If you design it right, it will not oscillate when there's not a stimulus present. One of the problems with tunnel diodes and reflection amplifiers in general is that they're intrinsically unstable. The all amplifiers are intrinsically unstable. That's what makes them amplifiers, right? They have some sort of positive feedback that makes them want to compound the frequencies uh, that, they're, that, that are being input to them. And tunnel diodes are, are no different. When you bias a tunnel diode in the negative region, it wants to oscillate, and it's going to try its darndest to oscillate at whatever frequency that you allow it. This, this really frustrates a lot of electrical engineers because they can't even run a tunnel diode through a conventional curve tracer. Do, do you remember doing a curve tracer when you were an undergraduate? Your instructor gave you a device, and they said, put it in a curve tracer, and we'll measure the VI characteristic for you. They could do BJTs that way, diodes, uh, FETs, whatever device. And the, usually most curve tracers have at least three ports on them. So that was fine. If you do that with a tunnel diode, you're probably going to get garbage. Because what will happen is it will start to trace off that ohmic region. And then all of a sudden you'll hit the negative resistance region. And you know the thing is, the leads to the tunnel diode and the curve tracer hardware itself is a transmission line with it that presents an impedance differing at various frequencies. So whether you've intended to or not, you've connected it to a frequency selective transmission line that a little noise is going to excite the tunnel diode, which is going to reflect the reflection, which is going to come back and reflect back into the tunnel diode, and back and forth and back and forth. And before you know it, this thing is just, in a matter of picoseconds or nanoseconds, this thing is reflecting back at a particular frequency that you can't even measure with your little DC curve tracer. So usually when you, when you do this experiment, well, I think you get this the curve. Uh, I'll draw it on the board. You'll get curve, and then your trace starts to look like this. Then curve. My postdoc has been measuring some of these lately, and he's been complaining. He's like, Isaki, the guy that, in, the Japanese guy, Leo Isaki, that uh, invented the tunnel diode, he said, you should have gotten a Nobel Prize just for being able to measure the thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's too complicated, too hard to make a measurement sometimes. You have to, to do all these tricks to, to even make the measurement. But eventually what happens is that wave hits the tunnel diode, and instead of going to infinity, reflecting infinite power, what eventually will happen is that the signal will cut off wherever it starts to bend back. That's the extent of the, the negative resistance region. If the signal gets too large, it'll basically clip, and you won't get any additional power back. But it turns out that there, this is a, a perfectly fine uh, way to amplify a signal. And in fact, this harkens back to the old days of, of microwave engineering because what, what we're actu it's actually resembling is something called injection locking. How many have ever heard that term before? So back in the old days of tube amplifiers and high-powered sources that were not solid state. Sometimes you could only build a high-powered source that was a one-port device. A classic example is the magnetron in your microwave oven. Has anybody ever looked at a magnet, bro broken open a, a microwave oven and looked at the magnetron? Has anybody studied magnetrons? Does anyone even know how to spell magnetron? No? So this is old engineering practice that nobody appreciates anymore. So a magnetron, how anybody thought of this? You know, when, when, when you're limited with your tools, you sometimes develop uh, very creative ways to circumvent problems. And the magnetron was like a, a staple of high-powered RF and microwave engineering. And it would later be supplanted. You could do most of the things that you need to do with solid-state electronics, except for cooking, because that's still high-powered. And we don't have semiconductors that do really well still mass market it hundreds of watts of power, a couple thousand watts of power. But it turns out that this 
form a vacuum tube called the magnetron uh, works, works well. So the way that a magnetron works, if you were to cut open the cavity, you'd see like a flower almost. So this would be your cavity. And if I were to look at it from the side, these chambers would be lined up this way. And so what they do is they apply, they have a cathode. This is that what originates the electrons. And you heat it up. And then on the other side of the vacuum chamber is an anode. Remember, anodes are positive, cathodes are negative. So electrons always want to go to the positive, right, because they're negative. They flow that way. So you make, uh, this would be kind of like the back of your television set in the 1990s, right? You had those cathode ray tubes, cathode, you heat it up, you apply a big voltage, in this case a big DC voltage like this, and you create an electron beam. You heat up the cathode, the electrons are getting hot, they're ready to jump off of the, the cathode, and they travel down to the anode in the vacuum, accelerating as they go and making a nice electron beam. Now the thing that makes a magnetron a little bit special is they, you also add a DC magnet. So you get a nice north and south pole. And really, you only need one of these, but this kind of shows the flow of the magnetic flux here. Magnetic flux goes from here to here. Now, what happens in that instance when you have this magnetic flux that probably more realistically Forget this here. It kind of bends around like this. So you got a magnet up here. You can put it on either end. But either way, the flux is going to come out and bend around like this. Now you have a, a beam that's traveling through there, through this flux. And as the flux fringes out, I get electron traveling this way, and it's negative charge, so it's velocity vectors in the helm in the the Lenz law equation um, that you learned in physics. There's a good point this way. B field this way. Where does the force on the, the electron point? That way. So it's going to swing it around. And as it swings around, the magnetic flux is going to change over here. As it so basically, with the presence of this DC magnetic field, the beam is going to spin around like this. And as it spins around this chamber, it's going to go across these little gaps and create waves that resonate with the little cavities on the side. And so you keep hitting it with energy, you keep ringing the bell. Because remember, this is a highly charged negative electron beam. When the electron beam is really close to this piece of metal, it's going to push the electrons around and they're going to want to travel around like this. And when it comes over here, then that's going to be the opposite. It's going to push the electrons out. So, so you're kind of ringing the bell at a particular frequency depending on the size of the chamber. And that's going to create an electromagnetic wave at that frequency. So if you have a bunch of tuned chambers, they should all resonate at roughly the same frequency. Now, the interesting thing about a magnetron is you can hook up an antenna to it and excite a very, very dirty wave coming out there. Why? Because there's no discipline to the thing. There's, you know, you, these are not very high Q resonators, and you'll be lucky to get a Q of one or 2,000, or maybe, maybe 10,000 if it's a good cavity resonator. But that's hardly the type of, of uh, Q factor that you would expect from, uh, say, a, a disciplined microwave or UHF oscillator. So when you look at it on the, the you know, if you were to look at this on the, si um, on the oscilloscope, you'd see a very dirty sine wave. By dirty, I would mean that the amplitude would fluctuate. 
and the frequency, exact instantaneous frequency would drift around. If you looked at it on the spectrum analyzer, the output of this thing would be this peak as if it was a signal spectrum, but it would be, have very dirty what we would call skirts. So, and, and when you're heating up food at 1200 watts, who cares, right? As long as the skirts aren't leaking out of band and causing a lot of problem for communications. In fact, this is one of the reasons why 2.4 to about 2.48 or up to 2.5 gigahertz in some countries is an unlicensed band because all the magnetrons are centered somewhere around there in microwave ovens. And they are putting out an unreasonable amount of interference. You ever knocked out your Wi-Fi when you heated up a burrito or a bowl of noodles? No, you never did. You, like we're downloading, watching a movie on net, one of those services, and you turn it on the microwave oven, and pfft. no, you must have good microwave ovens. <laughs> or maybe you're using 5.8 gigahertz <laughs> routers now. I don't know. But one of the reasons this is an unlicensed band is because nobody would ever want to operate in here because it's too intermittent. You could knock this out uh, with a, uh, whenever you heat up your mic microwave. So that means that we can never use magnetrons in communication systems, right? Well, no, because you can turn them into reflection amplifiers and they work great. So what happens is you have a, a magnetron and you hook this to a coupler, a directional coupler. So the directional coupler, you put a solid state signal in to the, the coupler. It goes into the chamber of the magnetron. And it turns out as soon as you put a fairly strong solid state amplifier signal, that's what injection locking is. It, it injection locks. You've injected the signal. And now all of a sudden, that dirty old microwave signal tightens up considerably and it only adds power to the incoming signal that you've put into the system. Then the signal reflects out at a much higher power level. And in this way, you can turn a dirty reflection amplifier into a disciplined source that could be used for communications. Not something that's going to leak all out of band, something that you can even dial in for the solid state oscillator, which can be, you know, a hundred or a thousand times lower in power and still discipline the oscillator. Then you can make it out of solid state materials. You can do phase lock loops. You can do frequency hopping. Uh, you can program very carefully what the, uh, what the exact frequency is, dial it in, change it however you like. All the things that we do with solid state oscillators now. And then use this big high powered magnetron or whatever device that you've connected with to amplify it. A device that traditionally only has one port. So really, the tunnel diode example that we just looked at is at the opposite end of the spectrum. We're, we're used to thinking of injection locking as something that you do for high powered sources. Oh, uh, yes. What is injection locking again? Uh, that's what I sketched right here. This is called injection locking, where you are taking an amplifier that normally would have a very dirty output. Very, uh, it, it has a. We would describe it as a single frequency. This is a, you know, a 2.45 gigahertz magnetron that I've sketched here. But really, the instantaneous frequency and the instantaneous amplitude are very dirty. It fluctuates over time. And so when we, spe when we graph it on the spectrum analyzer, it would look very dirty. 
it would not be locked to a particular frequency. But this idea of putting in a low powered signal to force it to a particular frequency and then letting that frequency come back with more power, that's what we call injection locking. It's an old trick that many RF engineers from the past use. We're talking yet about it in a very different context, however, because we're not using high-powered signals. We're using really low-powered signals. And so now, the paper that I put online, the one with the motto, he's measuring from 30 to 40 dB of gain. So let's see. Mato was a Georgia Tech PhD who recently defended. So really what his, his setup looks like is he's got a tunnel diode. RF choke. And a variable DC source. That's basically binary. It's turning on, turning off, turning on, turning off. It's not turning on very much. It could be biasing at maybe like 90 millivolts, for example. 90 or 120 millivolts, it depends on where you, what kind of device you're using. It's a very weak signal. It consumes about 23 microwatts of power. But you're getting significant amplification. As the wave strikes this, you're getting a wave that's reflecting back that's about 1,000 times or more stronger. Because this is in the dB scale, keep in mind. Now, the power that you're reflecting back is still not, cannot possibly be more than the power you're consuming, right? But it's still significant. And he has some uh, recent uh, I don't think he's have a, he hasn't published it yet. Uh, he had a journal paper accepted, and he's actually getting data across Midtown Atlanta in a line of sight link. So he's got a, a device that's I think it was about 1,200 meters, 1 1.2 kilometers away, and he's actually reflecting real information from that to and from using a very low-powered transmitter on the top of a roof building on Georgia Tech campus, and just a standard backscatter receiver with a little coding to it. So this is one uh, technique that you can use to enhance backscatter and break through this traditional linkage uh, problem where you say, well, I'm doing a backscatter link. And you know, at best, maybe I can get 50 or 60 meters out of that in a line of sight environment. Why? Because I'm in a radar scenario. And I have one over R to the fourth losses, even in free space. The losses accumulate very quickly. And so very few off-the-shelf pieces of equipment can get a backscatter signal and decode it from more than tens of meters away. The RFID tag equipment that's being used nowadays, that doesn't work more than 50 or 60 meters away because tags don't even power up at 25 meters away. So who cares about making it more sensitive, right? So this is a technique for enhancing the sensitivity and boosting the range well beyond what you can normally expect. We'll talk a little bit more about this. It's time for a break. Okay, back to it. Um, did you think of any questions while we were taking that intermission? No? Perfect understanding. As usual, expect nothing less from this class. Um, okay, so the Francesco Francesco's paper is up there for you to to look at in T square. He is basically using his tunnel diode as a reflection amplifier, and this allows you to backscatter with ranges. compared to purely passive, typical ranges are from 20 to 50 meters, 
tunnel diode we get greater than one kilometer backscatter and this is typical free space okay now what I wanted to spend some time doing it was printing out some notes to do this is uh, an equivalent circuit model that we found very helpful for dealing with backscatter links because now you have some interesting things going on, right? If you have a, a nonlinear device like a tunnel diode or a charge pump even connected to an antenna, that in and of itself is kind of difficult to model because you've got a source, an antenna source. We've talked about how to go from propagation to equivalent circuit model to treat antennas as sources that are receiving signals. And then that connects to something like a charge pump or some sort of nonlinear circuit. And nonlinear circuits are hard to simulate. Well, now if you've got a, a device that is absorbing power in a nonlinear sort of way and also reflecting power in a nonlinear sort of way, how do you even track what that looks like? Because you can say, well, okay, I've got SPICE. I've got circuit modeling tools. And that tells me what the circuits are doing. But what does that do for the propagation? What's that going to do for the communications in a reflection radio system? And you know, we've, we've got some modeling tools for propagation in general, but the, the bl there's a black box as far as what's actually connected to the antennas in these components. So I like to, I call this the, the unified I'll put these notes on. They're, they're not actually a published article. They're just sort of loose notes. Unified circuit model. For backscatter. And what it allows you to do is put everything into a certain equivalent circuit model and derive whatever physical parameter that you want, whether it's power, voltage, what's going on in the circuit, what's going on in the channel. And so to start with, we have our transmitter and our receiver. And in a backscatter system, that constitutes the reader. There is transmit power going in and some sort of signal power coming out of the receiver. Transmitter sending a wave out to a tag. that is connected to some sort of load. And some of that is being reflected back to the receiver. So how do you track signals that flow in this system? OK, so to do that, here's a really helpful equivalent circuit model. First of all, when you're dealing with far field radio wave propagation, we, we call that in electromagnetics TEM propagation in the far field. And TEM stands for transverse electromagnetic. It just means that the E field and the H field and the direction of propagation are all mutually orthogonal to one another. And that happens when you get a nice plane wave that sets up, which is pretty much how we model far field propagation. If you move far away from, uh, far enough away from a source, it looks like it, that source is a point source and that you're getting a plane wave washing over you locally in space. So the other type, what other type of TEM propagation have you studied in your classes or practice in your engineering. Well, transmission lines are considered TEM propagation because the, they have E fields and H fields and directions of propagation that are at least approximately mutually orthogonal to one another. And so it's always nice to model propagation as 
transmission line. So free space propagation. Zoom down here. You can give it an eta of 377 ohms or whatever medium that you're operating in. 377 ohms is the impedance of free space, the ratio of E to H current, or in a transmission line, V to I. So that's actually nice because it allows you to uh, formulate uh, a voltage and current equivalent in this circuit model. Now, what happens at the antenna for this model? That wave gets to the antenna, and in a backscatter system, that antenna reflects part of that power back. Well, in the case of tunnel diodes or some other reflection-based amplifier, additional power back. How do you model that? So we found that this is a very helpful equivalent model for an antenna. Model it as an ideal transformer whose ratio, whose windings is a ratio of the square root of eta, which is your medium impedance, to the square root of the real part of your antenna impedance. So think of an antenna as a transformer. It presents one impedance to a voltage and a current, or in this case, an E and an H field, on one side of the transmission line, which is your propagation channel. And then it transforms it to a different combination of voltage and current that gets presented to whatever your tag circuitry is. And ZL could be anything. It could be a charge pump. It could be a tunnel diode. It could be a FET switch modulator. It could be a detector circuit for communications. It could be all of those things in parallel, which would have some weird nonlinear curve associated with it. And then, in series, you have to put this J sub A term. This is the reactive component of the antenna. And the reason why this is a really nice circuit to use to model backscatter is that Let's look at what is the Thevenin equivalent impedance and source when I look at it from the load side, from the load's perspective. So I still have my Z sub L here, which is complex. I'll put a squiggle. I don't think the notes have a squiggle, but it's a phaser. Well, I have to take whatever voltage I have here and transform it all the way forward. So here's the interesting part. If I make sure I get my expression right. The feminine equivalent impedance is my source impedance, my ZA, basically the same antenna impedance that we measure when a network analyzer, what we've been dealing with all day, all class long, all course long. It's just the real part R sub A, the same parameter I put in here, and the J sub A there. V sub A, the sinusoidal source that I put there, 
is whatever the impinging wave is coming down the line, V plus two V plus times the square root of RA over eta. And so that's nice because my V plus, I can convert I can calculate that from the link budget or from basic physics. Uh, it, it gives you a formula in the paper. It's basically based on the link budget. This is how much energy density do I have striking my antenna with gains g sub t and g sub little t for tag antenna. And then once I have that voltage, I can then create a Thevenin equivalent voltage over here that describes how that antenna behaves as a source. And then what I can do is present a Thevenin equivalent impedance looking this way. In other words, what does this look like in this model? Well, this, let's call it ZA prime. This is sort of like, how does the antenna behave if, if we treat the propagation as a transmission line? You got a wave coming down, it strikes the antenna and reflects back. So here's a nice expression, and it all comes from circuit theory. You can all derive it basically from this equivalent circuit of this circuit right here. And we find that that is equal to eta over RA times ZL plus JXA. So if we said this was free space that presents with impedance eta, and here's my Thevenin equivalent impedance ZA prime, what is my load modulation coefficient in that case? In other words, depending on what RL is, what reflection, what gets reflected back, from this. Well, remember your definition of load, mod, uh, load modulation coefficient on a transmission line. It's the load impedance minus the intrinsic impedance divided by the load impedance plus the intrinsic impedance. Load impedance in this case is Z sub L, or no, Z sub A prime Intrinsic impedance is eta. Well, we have an expression for the intrinsic impedance for, uh, for Z sub A prime, because it, I put use a prime because it's not the same as Z sub A. Z sub A is the impedance as presented from, as seen by the load side. This is the in, uh, impedance of both the antenna and the load presented from the source side or the propagation side. So let's plug this in. Here's my ZA prime. And again, ZA prime. plus eta. And let's see, all the eta's are going to cancel, right? And if I multiply through by RA over RA, what I'll get is that reflection coefficient is equal to ZL plus JXA minus RA over ZL plus JXA plus RA. I can simplify this further by calling this ZL. This is like minus ZA, except if I, if I do this, you'll notice that I'll have to take complex conjugate. And I don't need to do that in the denominator. I can just leave it as Z plus ZA. And that should look like a familiar formula. That's like the for formula that we've learned all the time. 
And now it kind of makes a little bit more sense. Why do you put the complex conjugate in the numerator but not the denominator? You know, why isn't it just the straight up load formula? Why is ZL minus ZA over ZL plus ZA? Or if you're gonna complex conjugate one, why don't you do it in both the top and the bottom? Well, the reason is the perspective is a little bit different. This is, we're using the tag antenna combo is our load and our transmission line is free space. So we would expect it to have this form rather than the standard load co reflection coefficient form of a simple transmission line terminated by a Z sub L. And so this helps us uh, sort of organize the information. And what's neat about this equivalent circuit model is that now you can simulate the whole thing end to end in PSPICE. So now I have a transmission line Ideal transformer. And tag load. And there's a whole mapping in that, that set of notes that shows how do you equate equivalent um, properties. So if you know what the V minus is, the reflected wave from your circuit simulator, there's a simple way to go straight to that and calculate received power. If you know what your transmit power is at your receiver, there's a really simple way to go from there to V plus and start this and basically set up the source for the simulation. And so this allows you to go into a P-SPICE or a microwave design studio or whatever software tool that you're using that's really good at circuit simulations and actually put the entire system of what we've been talking about into an equivalent circuit model. And now you could put here you know, a nonlinear charge pump or a nonlinear tunnel diode and try to simulate the effects on the communication system. What do I see a few hundred meters away at my receiver when I excite this system with a sine wave? What do I do with it if I excite it with a power optimized waveform or some sort of peak to average power signal that has a lot of, that's gonna invoke a lot of nonlinearities? One of the topics that's not on your projects, but one of the interesting topics that uh, has been thrown around by various people um, is the idea that, well, sometimes we can't get a charge pump to turn on However, we still can invoke some of the nonlinearities. We can still detect the nonlinearities. So for example, let's say I have a charge pump as Z sub L. That of course is gonna be some combination of diodes and capacitors. And what's more, if I don't have a certain threshold voltage, then I'm not gonna get enough output on that system to, to power up my tag and do communications and sensing. However, before I power up, I still should start to see some sort of nonlinearity there, right? I should be able to excite it. And if I, if I knew there was a tag present, but I couldn't actually talk to it, I couldn't power it up and get it its memory and all that other stuff, then if I at least knew where it was, I could steer power over towards it. And so uh, we have this idea floating around at Georgia Tech. It's called, uh, because we don't, haven't thought of a better word, name for it, charge tickling. Nobody's ever studied this before. So we don't, that's the only name that we have. But we've got there's like some guys over at GTRI that has done, have done some experiments. But the idea is that, you know, let's say the instructor has their eyes closed and everybody else in the class is partly asleep. How do I figure out where to, how to wake you guys up 
I said, well, I could transmit a lot of power by just screaming. Or I could just like start poking places, right? I poke over here and I find, uh, oh, no, wait, I gotta poke over there. I poke over at my Dylan tag. <laughs> And I find that the, when I hit, poke him a little bit with a little bit of energy, he doesn't wake up, but he kind of twitches. And I can sense the response. I said, wait a second. Looking at that nonlinear response, I now know that somewhere in that direction is Dylan. And so I'm going to take my array or whatever, steer a beam towards him and hit him with more power. Not increasing the transmit power that I'm transmitting, just making it more directional. And hopefully with four or five extra dB, Dylan will be able to wake up and respond. Dylan will respond to my query more readily. And therefore I can, exchange, I, I can extend the range of Dylan. So if anybody's interested in that topic, I didn't put that down as a potential topic, but that would be an example of something that nobody's ever studied before. And it would be a relatively straightforward thing to do. You just get on, on Spice and get some models for charge pumps and look at hitting this, that with, uh, you could even use a power optimized waveform. Because the goal isn't just to power it up, it's just to see if it, it exists. And if you have multiple antennas, can you look at the return the amplitude and phase of the return and actually see if there is, if you can triangulate where Dylan is, so you can send him more energy. There aren't that many things in nature that actually produce a nonlinear RF return, right? So if you put two sine waves together, for example, you should see some intermod products if you hit Dylan with both of those sine waves at the same time. So you'll see these amplitude and phase of these little intermod products. And if you see that, then is there a way to turn that into directionality and excite Dylan with more power? I don't know, just something to think about. good project topic. But anyway, this equivalent circuit model is really important for studying problems like that, where the nonlinearity is over here, but the electrical signal that you're trying to study is in the receiver. How do those link together? Well, there's this whole aspect of propagation and scattering, but it can be reduced to an equivalent circuit model. So you can't read too much physics into this, because at the end of the day, it's equi an equivalent circuit model but it helps you link those two worlds of RF engineering and circuit modeling, or sometimes RF engineering, antenna engineering, propagation engineering, and circuit models. You know, those are four different people in our university system, the way that we silo our engineers and expertise. Anyway, any more questions? Any questions about that? No? Oh, good. I wanted to cover that to make sure that since we're getting into, since we got into tunnel diodes and nonlinear modulators. So the next thing that I want to talk about is noise. And this discussion is probably going to go beyond the next 15 minutes or so that we have together. Um, but I'll give you a, it'll be just a nice lead in, into the next uh, let class period. So in radio communications, the way that we demodulate signals, most of our wireless channels that we deal with, when we talk about smartphones or satellites or point-to-point uh, -point microwave links, radars, et cetera, these are all what we would call AWGN channels. Additive. White, Gaussian noise. And we represent the signals as X of T. This is our data signal. It means we're going to add a zero noise 
white gaussian process to that white means all the frequencies are excited uniformly why because we're either dealing with the background radiation of the universe or our environment due to thermal noise over a band that looks relatively over a radio band that'll look relatively flat it does have some frequency selectivity if you go over octaves but just over a regular uh, what we would consider to be a broadband radio signal in electrical engineering that would be a, a relatively frequency flat process and if it's not no if it's not thermal noise it's man-made noise and we say there's enough of it that it kind of looks like additive Gaussian noise anyway so in this scenario, if this is digital data, and this is a additive white Gaussian noise, what's the best way to demodulate that? What's the best way to detect what has been sent? What did you learn when you studied digital communications in your undergraduate days? Does anybody remember what it's called? the way that we detect this signal. Was that there? We'll have to play hangman. <laughs> oh, DJ, give me a letter. Sid? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mulyang, letter please. You, you don't even want to guess a letter? Uh, 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 o. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the state of undergraduate education today is really paining me. Buzz, letter. What? Way to save the class, Buzz. Dylan, give me a letter. What did you say, Mulia? Oh, I like it. I'll just put that in there. And what's the top one? I need another letter. We're back to you, Sid. I'll give you a hint. There are 20 more that we haven't <laughs> used. B. Aditya. Matched filter. Matched filter. There you go. You win the vacation to Hong Kong, Buzz. <laughs> no. OK. Matched filter. Nobody knew what a matched filter was. Have you ever heard of that? Now, you should, at least half of you should be saying, oh, yeah. Like, I, can, I get that the physics guy didn't know that because it's beneath him. It's practical. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I have six electrical en engineers in the class, and, and nobody knew what a matched filter was. You've heard of it. OK, OK. That makes me feel a little better. <laughs> Anyway, the way that you demodulate this is with something called a matched filter. So the assumption is I've got a filter here, and the frequency response of this filter should basically be the complex conjugate. I should write it like this. The complex conjugate of whatever pulses were used. Uh, Get my terminology straight. So, X of T is a data signal. It has a power spectral density. Uh, 
power spectral density, x of f. It's created from a bunch of little pulses, say p of t. Maybe if you're using square waves, little boxes. If you're using raised cosines, it looks something like this. Whatever it is, you make a filter that is the complex conjugate of that exact same frequency response. And then you sample it every symbol period. And the goal here isn't to get the highest signal to noise ratio or the, the actually it is to get the highest signal to noise ratio of a particular point in the sample where you're sampling the amplitude of the pulse. This is basically the, the structure that you use that is the optimal linear filter for detecting the presence or absence or amplitude of a digital pulse. You can show through math, this is the best way you can do it and still be a linear filter. It doesn't reproduce the actual signal most faithfully, but for additive white Gaussian noise, this is the best way to detect the signal. So I get out of here a bunch of samples, a bunch of detection samples that tells me whether the pulse is present or if so, what amplitude and phase does it have. And one can see this as sort of a correlation filter because really the act of complex conjugate is like time reversal in uh, the time domain. So if your pulses are triangles, then the impulse response of your H of T is going to be time reverse triangles, or guess what, triangles. And then you're convolving something with itself that's like a correlation. And so you get an output that doesn't look really like your input, but it turns out that if you sample at that peak correlation point, then you get a, the best possible estimate for what this symbol is, if there's Gaussian noise present. And that's the trick, because in a lot of these low-powered uh, communication links, we don't have an additive white Gaussian noise process. We've got colored noise. Now, what, what do we mean by colored noise? Well, If noise is white, really we're importing some optics into our terminology, even though we're talking about radio waves or even lower frequencies in many instances, right? White light means that all of the frequencies are equal, present in equal quantities. That kind of gives you white light when you look at it with, with your naked eye. It actually doesn't because your perception of the different frequencies is not as sensitive as others. But let's pretend for a minute that that's true white. So if, however, your noise profile, and here what I'm graphing would be something like the power spectral density of noise. Noise as a function of frequency. It doesn't matter what the frequencies is, are. In fact, we use these terminologies for noise that, has, <laughs> that have many orders of magnitude lower than optics. If your noise kind of ramps up like this, we often call that blue noise or violet noise. And if your, your noise power ramps up at the low frequencies, we often call that red noise or pink noise. Because of course the red in an optical red, red, Dylan colored and blue would be on opposite ends of the frequency spectrum if this were truly optics. Now what causes colored noise? The, the thing that you're most interested in is actually this red or pink noise. because 
for red or pink noise, when you look at the low frequency output of electronics, let's say I'm, let's just say, hypothetically, I've got an oscillator. What the oscillator should put out is a perfect frequency tone, right? We always draw it in this class as cosine 2 pi ft, which means it's the world's perfect oscillator. There's no phase noise when I draw it like that. The amplitude doesn't vary. It's always at the exact frequency for all times. But that's actually not how an oscillator works. Any realistic oscillator will actually have frequency drift, a little bit of amplitude drift, and various other things. So if you, if you graph the output on a spectrum analyzer, what you'll find is that instead of the ideal perfect impulse as a function of frequency, you'll get something called skirts. In fact, we just talked about the skirts of the magnetron, which is a really dirty oscillator. There are skirts for a regular oscillator, too. Hopefully, they're a lot tighter around the carrier frequency. But there are still skirts around there. And the problem is, when you go to modulate data onto that signal, to use backscatter modulation, for example, you're putting that data on the carrier. So if I were to just take a bunch of random ones and zeros, one, zero, one, zero, drive a field effect transistor switch with that signal connected to an antenna, I would get a signal. Well, the, what's the baseband power spectral density of a signal that I've drawn like that? I just take a bunch of square wave pulses and actually put information on the, the square pulses, not just a repetitive signal, which would just be a bunch of spectral lines. But I actually put information on that. What would the power spectrum look like or the power spectral density of that signal look like? Well, those informative signals that are constructed from pulse P, well, when you, when you add a lot of data, will reflect back with magnitude pulse Fourier transform P's magnitude squared's power spectral density. So if, if I use square pulses in the time domain, What's the Fourier transform of a box, of a square pulse? Sync. My power spectral density should then take the shape of sync squared. So that if I looked at this on the net, uh, spectrum analyzer, what I'm actually doing is sending data that looks like sync squared, like sine squared over t squared, or f squared in this case sine squared. And the problem with this is that we're dealing with low powered communications because the faster you have to clock the electronics, the more power it consumes, which means this signal is necessarily going to hug this carrier. But the carrier has dirty noise down here right in the middle of the signal that I'm transmitting. So if I were to look at this at baseband, if I down convert this to baseband, then I am going to have a signal like this and some red noise or pink noise that looks like this. The, sig the noise is actually going through the roof right where the peak information content is in my signal. Well, this causes all sorts of problems. We talk a little bit more next class period about the, the electronic origins of these noises, because it's not just the dirtiness of the oscillator, but there are also some attributes of amplifiers and mixers that cause low frequency noise down there. And that occurs exactly where most of your information is on a backscatter system. So we'll talk about ways that we practically remove that noise, both with hardware and then also some coding. We can apply some special codes to make our modulation signal look as if it has more frequency content than it actually does. That's going to be the subject of Wednesday's talk. So I will see you on Wednesday. Do you have any questions? I'll shut off the recording then. <laughs>